Welcome back to episode four of Pro Coach Radio. We're joined by Texas, Texas finest gentleman, the one and only Luke Miller. Welcome. Thank you for having me on, guys. You know, you know, I am as big of a fan of Pro Coach as you guys are for promoting it. So it's uh, it just feels like family when I come on the podcast here. <laughs> the, yeah. the last time we were together was in was in destination for the seminar, right? The three of us. No. Yeah. No, all wait, three of us. Yeah, yeah. all three yeah. of us. All three of us. Yeah, I got to hang out a little bit at the Olympia. You just you got to drop a not even the drop a remix, Luke. What's the set, set up there? This it's is, crazy. This <laughs> is the, the recording. Um, now that I'm stopped bodybuilding, I'm getting into my rap career. So <laughs> I will be. All he does now. Be. All he does now is rap and golf. <laughs> 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 and then he raps about golf. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Uh, the, hottest, the hottest tea mix this year. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we're actually changing changing the podcast platform, so we had to kind of step it step it up a bit no. from an equipment standpoint. So we're is this uh, the uh, is this your office now? Or this the studio now? Yeah, yeah. So we've got the whole studio in here. It actually goes to the right. You can't see it off camera, but um, we've got chairs and other mics set up over here. Um, and luckily it's not on camera, but the decorations are not finished. So once it's finished, it'll be full functional operating studio. So nice, man. Um, super excited about it, man. It's uh, the the progress just from thinking about five years ago to now is just wild. Just like this is work for me now, getting to talk to my best friends in the industry. So yeah. uh, awesome. it's wild. How's, uh, how's Emily doing? Very pregnant. She is... Um, <laughs> miserable of being pregnant she <laughs> took a i took a picture of her yesterday and i think she's like i got a good like two foot of like belly and it's just wild how 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 pregnant she is but yeah. um, she's so there's, just, there's so little of her she's she's a small lady you know she's it's... wider than she is tall she's like five foot <laughs> on a good day um no but she's 37 weeks this friday so that's full term so we'll be having a baby in the next three weeks i know cal's rooting for march 3rd Gun in for March third. I'm gunning for March third. Gun for March third. That's your birthday. You. That's your birthday, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I'm holding you to your promise, though. If she comes on March third, man, I'm booking my flight. <laughs> <laughs> if she comes in, I'm getting like a private jet. Cal's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> gonna deliver the baby. She's gonna come <laughs> and scrub. She, she'll let the doctors are gonna be like, right, we got. She's one hour out, and I'll run the scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> well, who's oh, this nice goodness. family doctor <laughs> oh man that'd be wild that's so exciting MD. so exciting what's um what's been going on in your side you picked up golf again right i've been seeing the um the swingers come out in full force yeah so i've actually decided to hang up bodybuilding for myself um oh I just, uh, from a coaching perspective, I just, I can't do, I can't justify it. Um, I have too many athletes competing at too high of a level where the amount of time, and honestly, I'm realizing mental space that bodybuilding took up for me. Um, it's just not worth it anymore. Um, it was the level or what I was having to do for the level I would compete at is just, it's, it's below what I'm coaching at. At, by like leagues right and it's i have people who are capable of qualifying for the o this year and it's that and then we're releasing j3 level two this year so like there's going to be a lot on that side and so um i honestly like since stepping away i think i was operating at like 75 percent mm. which is no realizes how much time it takes up it's it's scary how much mental capacity like i i wrote a whole outline of j3 level two like i wrote the entirety of the the framework for the course in like a week and a half and it's yeah. like man this is like the levels from a mental standpoint that i can i can i can handle so it's just gonna make me a better coach it's gonna make me a better educator um i'm gonna be able to do more and honestly dubai was where i realized it um where we're there and like i kind of planned a deload across that week so that i didn't have to worry about it and just mentally, just the sharpest I'd been on a presentation standpoint. And man, even eating food the majority of the week, I lost like 12 pounds that trip. It's yeah. like, why am I trying to sustain this um, in a suboptimal way? And <laughs> kind of like Cal, like I just can't half do anything, right? Yeah. So um, 
yeah, it just it just made made the most sense for me. Um, and it's just... we we had a conversation like three a.m. on one of the mornings, and Luke <laughs> Luke looked over in the hotel room and was like, "I'm going to ask you a question." And I was like, "I want you, I want an honest answer." I was like, "How have you found the transition from stopping competing?" And I was like, "I know where this is going." <laughs> yeah, I just um, I I, uh, I I just couldn't do it, man. Um, and I am starting to realize how much I was leaving on the table as a coach. Um, now that I've made that decision, I'm training like three days a week. I'm really just going in there to help Josh more than I am training for myself. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going in with a coach's mindset, which is great because it allows me to do everything I need to do and not really care about from a performance standpoint. And, um, I just don't do well without some sort of competitive pursuit. And so golf is kind of becoming that again, and we'll see how far that goes. Coaching will always be the forefront. Right. But, um, just kind of seeing what I can do. It was my my everything for over 10 years. So um it's like riding a bike almost. Yeah. I get that as well. I was the same. I kind of went through a period up until a couple of weeks ago of kind of saying I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to park this one. Um and to be honest, I kind of found myself kind of like not necessarily voluntarily going into it, but just kind of like accepting the situation. I said, I'm going, it makes this easier if I just say that I'm I'm doing this by choice. When in reality, I wasn't. I just wasn't the top of my shit. You know, I've got, maybe, I could have made the call to the call not too long ago. Was, I've got, maybe I'm going to do one more just like steady push. And then if at the end of a kind of, you know, 10, 15 month period, there's something there that can maybe go and actually do something, then deadly. And if not, I'll hang it up there and I'll be like, you know what? I, I gave it a good go. I'm good at my job. That's as far as I need to do it, you know? Um, yeah. But I think I'm a bit too, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm in a situation now where my life's not in a place where I need to give it up just yet, you know? So I want that to choice. I want that choice to be mine and to actually be a choice rather than something that I feel kind of forced into. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's why I'm so okay with it now because it was my choice at the end of the day. Like I was sitting there and realized like I've been doing this for 10 years and then you just, you go like Cal and I were at Dungeon. We were watching some of these guys pose and they're like talking about bodybuilding for three, four five years. And they're just like pro caliber physiques that haven't done done the deed yet, right? Like, man, I've been doing this almost or over 10 years. Let's see, I'm 28 now. I started it when I was like 17 going into 18. So to not have that caliber of physique, it's just like very clear the genetic capacity that's there, right? Um, sure, maybe one day, 10 years from now, I manage a pro card in a master's class or whatever, but to what cost, right? Not only health perspective wise, but... Um, you know, from a business perspective, what I'm capable of on the coaching forefront and the educating forefront and changing the industry through that, it's like, man, I just, I'm not going to give that up. Yeah. I think it's one of those things that can be like a conversation that people meet with a lot of volatility, but like, I don't think, and I don't believe, and I, I stand by it to a certain extent, that to operate at the level that we all want to operate at, like let's say we're all operating at full capacity at the way that we like to deliver the service that we do. I don't fully think you can be 100% in that capacity for coaching and also for bodybuilding i don't think i don't actually think it's possible maybe for you know four five six week run but eventually you know it catches up on you you know you it, yeah. you just can't you, you kind of have to pick what direction you want to go in at some point in time now obviously i've not been met with that fork in the road just yet but i'm aware of that and i already kind of know what my choice is going to be you know and it's like i'm kind of the more people i talked in the space and the more people that i learn from and you know the kind of the direction that i want to take coaching i know for a fact i'm not going to be able to commit myself to bodybuilding while i do that mm -hmm. you know it's it's you're committing yourself to bodybuilding still but it's just in a different veil you know it's still commitment to bodybuilding but you're committing to make everyone else's journey of bodybuilding the best it possibly can be which for me gives me a hell of a lot more yeah yeah and i i just see this coming year as like a lot of people see the last two years as like my two biggest years of coaching so far which i would agree with a lot of people on that but um the potential for this year to be that is just like so high mm -hmm. just like so many pros competing and um once i get past like having the first baby I, I wasn't able to take anyone for the arnold because of the due date but um it's just it's just wildfire from like april all the way through the end of the year yeah. and uh it's like so many opportunities i just i can't let that slip through my hands right now yeah Probably not percent what's the what's the first show coming up over stateside well the arnold is the the earliest that's typically where we start the year um emily being due like the week of the arnold is kind of forced me to not do that right um so for us regional shows start here in april so like the first week of april is kind of regional right. level with the first pro qual being mid-may so like the second week of may 
Okay. Um, which I, I have a, a pretty decent crew considering doing that show because it's like junior USA's and junior nationals right there back to back May to June. And it's just like takes off from there. So um I have two yeah. doing I've got two doing doing junior nats this year in the States as well. Yeah. So I'll I'll have probably two or three doing junior nats. I've got one doing junior USA's, potentially three, depending on how fast these other guys preps go, guys and girls. Um but we'll see. We'll see. It's just, I need that flexibility to be able to be there if I need to be there. Right. And then with having a kid, like that's just going to be another variable to control and and, and juggle. Cause uh, I need to be there for, for Ellie. Right. So it's just yeah, making sure that sure. I'm the dad and the coach and, and able to juggle all that. Yeah, that's right. The bucket can only be filled with so much water. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's like put your eggs in one basket or spread them across many. And it's like, I just, I'm at the point where I can, I can put them into one and focus yeah. on that. Right. And it, it look, this might come from a different perspective than some of the people listening to the podcast. Cause for me, I coach because I love coaching. There's a lot of people who are going to listen to this, who coach because they need to financially support themselves, which it's, if that's the case, that's fine. Um, there's just a difference. And and Cal, you can speak to this as well. It's like, there's nothing wrong with with coaching to support your finances, but just be honest with what that is to you um, and the level that you're able to put into that. Yeah. And for me, my coaching is different in that I coach to coach. And I'm, I'm getting to the point where, honestly, my favorite part of coaching is not the X's and O's and talking from an education standpoint on like, well, if you see this with a thyroid lab, then you're going to be doing X, Y, Z. It's like the athlete development that comes with taking an athlete from where they start at like competing at a decent level all the way up to the highest level. And so yeah. to do that, it requires more of me in order to be able to develop athletes in that manner. So um, that's kind of where like a lot of my headspace is going. And it's why a lot of my content is going that direction, because you can teach anyone the X's and O's. You can't teach people the athlete development side. No, definitely not. Like I've said it before, that like the the education basis that we've all spent so much time in, it just makes you a better decision maker. You know, that's 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 really what it does for the most part. Obviously, like if you want to use education to kind of like you know swing your big brain dick around and tell everyone how smart you are, that's cool. You know, but if you're not producing something at the end of it, you know that kind of way. I think you you learn it the hard way. You're like, okay, I'm gonna go and do this, and this is gonna happen, and you're gonna go to the Olympia. It's like, oh wait, no, <laughs> you did that, that thing. Did that happen. did not happen. No, they cracked. Didn't. Yeah, but the cuffs told me it would happen. You know. It's like it just it just doesn't work that way, you know. And I, I think you're dead right in the sense that, you know, the the biggest thing I think that we all you know hold really close within the coaching space is that athlete development and watching them from where they are to go. And you know the the process of being the decision maker, I think, is something that's like a really worthwhile pressure. That's one thing that's that's what I'm loving at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I think too with with how available education is, you're getting a lot of people who are regurgitators, which yeah. will always be a problem in our industry, but. Um, we could really differentiate ourselves with showing how that that knowledge base is now applied because y'all know just as well as I do, like no case is ideal, yet we teach in ideals, right? And so I think if we can start to get away from teaching in ideals, maybe to teach a concept we do, but get away from teaching in ideals, but also applying it and understanding how, you know, sometimes we got to make a suboptimal decision because it's what we got to work with. Um yeah that's how we actually create client outcomes for people across the board rather than just a, a few select people. Yeah. You know, that, that was the, the broader spectrum message when we, when we did that seminar in Dubai as well, in terms of, um, and, and to be fair, the, the same in, in, uh, when we did it in Texas, where it was just, you know, you're, you're teaching, you're teaching off like a theory based concept, but then you're just applying it to like actual applicable situations with, with athletes. And I think mm -hmm. that, 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 level of application just refines itself and gets more and more accurate the more you spend time in those situations which is why like you know the more you coach the more athletes that you can that you can take through that process the more refined your eye for coaching gets and then you get to a point there's a reason why you there's a reason why you'll go to the olympia and you're looking around you're thinking mm, hang on a minute this guy's not doing the, you know that's not that's not textbook coaching that or he shouldn't be doing that that's not right it's like well there's a reason why this dude's fucking top 10 in the world. It's like you ask people that are placing at pro shows and placing the Olympia and you relate that back to the textbook or what's, what's clinically perfect. It's not going to go in the direction you think it's going to go in, in terms of what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. 
And it's like the strongest argument you can make, but also the hardest one for somebody who's like super devoted to education. Kind of space in here, it's like, well, like these guys aren't doing it. They're doing exactly what every single athlete who wants to go to the top end is doing. They aren't doing that, yeah. you know. And it's like it's it's that same old thing, you know. Like in, in a room full of merit, results speaks the loudest, you know. Like it, it doesn't really matter. I could sit there and tell you how many courses I've done, but if somebody is there and they've shown better results to me time and time and time and time and time again, that person deserves all the respect in the world, no matter how they did it. I think we still have to find the place where logical thought process still leads the way. Oh, for sure. But we create the results on the back end because the world of anecdote is where we got in a lot of the bad situations we were in or still are in, I think, in my opinion, um, with a lot of the coaching situations you see. So rather than like success rates being, because let's be honest, like most of the guys, because of genetic potential, have mm, two to six guys that are competing at a very high level, but they're not across the board doing that well with their athletes, you know, at a very high percentage. It's like, man, you could take that winning percentage from, you know, maybe those two to 10 athletes that they're working with that are winning at a high level to maybe 25 to 30 winning at a high level. It's like, that's where logical conversations and logical coaching process alongside being able to flex it into the unideal starts to, to come to play. And, I think that was the biggest difference between my year last year in 22 and my year in, in 2021 was um, learning that that aspect of not operating in the ideal because I, I won a fair amount in 21, but I then won that much more in 2022 because of that skill of being able to do that, right? And so being able to still apply logical thought processes and producing an outcome when the situation wasn't ideal. And so just as a coach, like that's where coaching development really starts to flourish and how we create a better overall outcome for the clients in the industry and as coaches as a whole. Yeah. And that I think that's sure. that shines its uh that shines its head in regards to like take for us take take us three for instance in terms of coaching you know, amateurs all the way up into that top level, whether it's an amateur in the NPC or a pro, you're seeing success across all the tiers of competitive sport there. Like you're seeing success across guys and girls going and, and winning regional shows or winning regional overalls. And then people winning pro cards, people doing well at pro shows, people winning pro shows. Like it, it, that, that doesn't happen by default across all levels, gifted and non-gifted just by chance. And obviously you're going to see a lot of the coaches out there worldwide who will have the Chris Bumsteads and the you know the name name the best open bodybuilder at the moment it's uh Hardy probably but like top three say Haney for example like all you see is his top pros now his application is obviously explicitly explicitly good at that level but he's also working with complete freaks yeah so for us it's the the foundation of our coaching is the ability to do that with you know everyone across the whole spectrum there if that makes sense yeah great yeah and i think that's i think that's where it's like you have that coach doing that it's just coming down to getting the opportunities at that point yeah. mm. right um and and once you get those opportunities you can't let them slip which is kind of part of what's pushed my uh decision to stop right it's just because i have some opportunities on my table and i can't let them slip through my fingers so yeah What's the uh, what's the golf setup at the moment then? What are we what are we doing in terms of practice? Oh man, so uh, <laughs> I actually had a lesson last week. I spent two hours with a guy who coaches uh, some guys on the PGA Tour, and I was I just asked the honest question because like my brain, like my brand, no switch fitness, like taking no off switch and results. It's just how mentally I operate, and I just can't operate outside of those confines. So. <laughs> I was like, how long do you think it would take for me to be competitive? Like after we get through like half the lesson, he's seeing me hit balls. He's fixing a, one one small thing in my swing. He's like, honestly, man, if you just practice, probably six months from now, you'd be a competitive golfer again. I was expecting to say like three years, four years, five years, right? But I I heard that and I was like, man, like I guess I should probably invest some time into this and, and see what I can do. So um, honestly, like I'm practicing probably four to six days a week in some capacity um just like fitting it into my day however i can it's no nowhere near what i did as a, a junior golfer right where i'd spend hours upon hours out there but go out there spend a couple hours on one skill come back and finish my work and obviously i'm not training as much because i'm because i'm doing that but 
it's, we'll also, it's also probably filling in that headspace that training was the yeah. that the void that's left there when you stop so to speak the golf is yeah. almost like the perfect thing to transition into that competitive little it's light bulb in your mind. No. I just John asked me yesterday because we recorded a podcast. He's like, "How's your training going?" And I was like, "What training?" Because it's like now that there's no competitive pursuit behind it, it's like I don't want to walk around at two fifty. I'm miserable up here. Yeah. Like it's it's hard for me to sleep at night because I'm too up in the two fifties, right? So I've actually kind of lost like fifteen pounds since I stopped over the last month. So i'm trying to get back <laughs> join the club bro multiply by 10 in the young kyle's weight loss oh man um i'm actually trying to get back down to like 230 to 220 because i just i don't want to walk around at how the size i'm at anymore it's just uh not conducive to anything <laughs> it's just so miserable um but yeah, so we'll, we'll see what that turns into. I, I really fully believe in my capacity, knowing the level I used to compete at. Like all of my peers that I played with growing up play professional golf now. Mm. Yeah. Right. And uh, it's funny. Netflix just released Full Swing, which is a golf documentary on last year's professional uh, golf tour. It's like if you sit down and watch who's like in it, it's like half of the people in it were people I played junior golf with growing up. It's like it's just... Was that in uh, was that in Texas or was that back in um Alabama where I grew up? Yeah. So we, we actually traveled all over the place. So like um I was I was able to play on like the top 10 US players for the US kids as a 12 year old against top 10 internationals. Um in, in North Carolina, we would go to California, pretty much anywhere in the US. Um I've been there to play golf. So that was like my life. Like I lived out of a suitcase from the age of 10 to about 17, 18. Mm -hmm. Um and just every other week, just tournament, tournament golf. So, uh, it's, it's hard because I, I competed at such a high level there where I saw the genetic capacity in that. And I have a lot of regret around the decision around quitting, but for me, it, it brought me this, which is so much more fulfillment in a, a coaching perspective that it's like, it's like, I see why it happened now because I'm doing something that's changing lives across the board. Like the amount of messages or things that we get just like not even for people that are coaching with me but people that are just watching the stuff that we do like the amount of people who have reached back out from the dubai seminar in some capacity yeah. like i had someone stop me in destination two weeks ago he was like man i grew up in dubai i'm from dubai i just recently moved here i saw what you've been doing out there and it's so cool to see that you and cal and john are out there if you guys ever do anything in the area, please let me know because your your content has changed how I handle myself from a bodybuilding perspective. Mm. And it's like you have someone who's like barely fluent in English stopping in the gym to tell you that it's like it's just it's just stuff that you uh, you dream of and then it starts to happen and it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd say man, it's really cool. Is uh, yeah. is um, what's John doing at the moment from a bodybuilding standpoint? He's he's competing this year. Um, I don't know if you saw, but he, he had some family lost recently. Yeah, um, I heard about, about this. So um, he's pushing back his first show. I think Tampa's going to be the first, and then he's going to do Texas, and then he'll kind of see from there. He was going to try to do Chicago, but with everything that's kind of happened, he's not sure if he'll be ready in time. Um, I believe he's going to do 212. He's, he's going to strip. Okay. I think so. I think he's going to strip it back and see. He's playing the what if game. Like, I'm going to just peel it back and see what's there. Yeah. But I would imagine by the time he peels it back, he'll probably be fully ready around 217-ish, which it's like, if you're that that close to 212, just make the weight and go. Yeah, right? yeah. So yeah. Um, that's, what, that's what I had. When, when we had that chat, when we were away, and he said he was obviously thinking about transitioning across, I was just, you know, but in that last prep, what he pulled down to relative to how much of a gap he still had, in my mind, I was like, with how competitive you can be in 212, like, why don't you just put the added tissue on and then just squeeze back into 212? Because, like, with that added muscle, muscle, it'll be, it'll be crazy. Yeah. And he's just got such a good frame. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen him pose in person, but you, just, you see him at his front shot. And it's like, I do not understand how it's humanly possible to have adductors that still touch with their feet that wide apart. And it's like <laughs> yeah, the craziest thing you've ever seen. It's like, 
Uh, it's just you, you would see that stack up so well in 212 just from a frame perspective. I, I, I don't believe he's going to end up doing open. He might do one just to do it, but yeah. I would imagine by the end of the year, he's doing 212 shows. Yeah, 100%. Ross, there was because John's flight was delayed when we, I think it was the way out it was delayed for like a, a night, I think in Texas. So he spent, he spent, um, spent the night at Luke's when he should have been coming over with Luke. He got what time did he arrive? He arrived at like 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or something on the Saturday. Walked into my room at 5 a.m. and we were leaving for the venue in 45 minutes. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is he, he he missed the flight in Dallas the night before. So he takes the flight the next night from Dallas. He gets to Qatar, misses the flight in Qatar <laughs> because he didn't get to the next terminal in time, stayed there overnight, took a like 1.30 or 2 a.m. flight, yeah. landed in Dubai. They went and picked him up, brought him to the room. I had like just gotten up from sleeping, I think like an hour and a half because Khaled and I had stayed up to like 4 a.m. that day. <laughs> and I woke up and I'm like getting up to like grab some food. I'm like, John's not here. That's weird. And then the door opens and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and he's like i'm so tired man but i just fuck it i'm gonna just send it and uh yeah that was that was crazy he he, he even said himself he's like i wish i would not have presented twice on that first day because <laughs> it was he said like my brain power is so like not here like i just i should have waited and done two the last day but uh, it was still awesome like you know how john is he's just too much of a brainiac to not deliver on a presentation right yeah i think john at 50 percent is all of us at 120 <laughs> the dude is walking pub man man it's uh yeah. it's fun it's fun to be around him but aggravating sometimes because he's just yeah. so fucking smart <laughs> on that um on that saturday morning we were on the way we were on the way to the uh, uh one of the boys picked us up and um john was there just like just in a little daze like just getting ready for the day and uh abdullah was like oh, I've, I've got some modafinil for him if he if he if he wants some modafinil and i was like bro you can't give John Jewett Modafinil because <laughs> end up he's gonna end up solving like all the world problems. <laughs> Could you imagine giving him a Daphnel? It'd be like it'd be like it'd be like it'd be like limitless. You just start fighting everyone. I think I think we need to try this for Australia and just see what happens. Oh yeah. Um, Are you still going out to um the lad show, Ross? Me, I'm not 100 percent sure just yet. Um, the way it's run is the, the latter end of April. He's the 23rd of April. His pro qualifier is, but it's like it's a big old trip, you know. Kind of I'm I'm very confident he's going to do it. Um, I'm, I'm really really confident. He looks sick. Um, but it's just like just trying to put all the pieces together to go. You know, that's just it's it's a, it's a long trip. It's fucking 27 hours, 30, 30, 27 hours travel or something. You know, is he doing bodybuilding or classic? He is in open. Okay, and he's, and he's a freak. He's yeah, a I got a, I got a classic guy doing the same show. No, no way, cool. Hmm. Um, then the, there aren't many pro qualifiers out there, are there? It's two what a year, say? two a year, yeah. It's only sure. two a year, which is pretty wild. So I said to him, I was like, you know, I, I kind of had to explain to him the whole idea, like when you're at that kind of car contention. I think we spoke about this on the previous podcast. Like, you, there's a period of time where you are going to have the box clever. Like, you can't just walk into a show and hope that this is it's going to happen for you. You know, you're you're going in there with the ideology that it might not happen obviously you want it to happen and you walk in there with the vindiction that you're going to do what you got to do but there's always the chance that somebody just edges you out on the day and obviously with him there's plenty of travel that needs to be done for him to go and find another pro qualifier so i've got to spoke to him already he's kind of aware that we don't just have a single opportunity this year like we have a couple um mm. so he's happy to dart around as he needs to as well there's a um there's an amateur olympia in i've got one let me double check the date because it's he... one it's in May in Tokyo, I think. Yeah, I was about to say, there's an Amateur Olympia in at the back end of the year. Amateur Olympia, Japan, 24th of November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, like, it's the supposed to be fairly accessible relative to like, the rest of the world, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not too bad. I think what he might do is him and his girlfriend might actually come and like, just bang around here for a couple of months and literally just prep out of, prep out of Europe. Um, and then just bounce the shows there. Because I think I like him on that side. He's a big boy. You know, like he's, he just needs, he just, like, like Lou just needs to walk into the right show and be in shape. You know, so it'll be uh he's figuring it out from there. But still we're gonna we're, I I'd still back to the the way the lines up are like I've seen a lot of the dudes doing season eight. There's some good boys there as well, but I still I still do think from a structure point of view, I don't think there's anyone in Australia who's built like him and open. Mm -hmm. Um he's very he's very, very good, you know. So just about getting him in on time and actually having the time to do it. Like Lou came to me last year, um, but he was only like three and a half weeks out from his uh 
is regional. So and like you have to work, you have to work to get in shape for that regional, you know. So like that immediately detrimented the ability to come in 100 percent the following show because of what had to be done to get them into shape for the regional, even in like proximity to shape. So the fact that we were left with like a 13 or 14 week window here is it just it just allows us to just take it down nice and steady and just ease everything in. And so far he's been able to hold the look really, really well and body weight's creeping down nicely. So it's gonna be a very, very, very different look that's presented. So that's why I'm pretty confident he's gonna be able to do what he needs to do. Nice, nice. Yeah. So sorry yeah. to add this, but Ross, I needed that accent to soothe my my earlobes. I haven't heard that in a long time. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Luke and uh, his partner love the way I talk. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see a part between? Did you know I've actively had to slow down my voice in the past two years since I moved here? Oh, he's looking. Yeah. I will find voice notes from like two or three years ago when I first met him, and I was like, "How are you getting on a bit like coach?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> so so fast. I've had to slow it right down. Uh, it's like stuck now. I gotta just talk slow, um, but I had to slow it way down. <laughs> You're still on like one point two for the WhatsApp yeah, yeah. message. One, one, like... one point two, one point five. <laughs> anything, anything over one point five, will I've got no idea what he's just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! Oh goodness. Yeah, it is good. What's the um? What's the progress on the um, g- gym facility front from your side, Luke? Uh yeah. Um, that's trying to stay as DL as possible. Um, but we'll we'll go into it. Um, so I can remove that if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's fine. I'm I'm fine talking about it. Um, it's probably a little over a year out. Um, just sourcing land here is a bitch. Um, it's such a costly investment for land by itself, let alone a structure that's going to be able to support um, all of the code that I would have to build it to in order to do it. It's it's probably going to be a little bit of more of a year pro- project. It's not a, uh, it's, it's not an issue from like, I need it public because it's going to be private facility, right? Just place for us to do seminars at, place to record the YouTube content, place for just my athletes to come and visit. Like, we just did an athlete weekend last weekend. It's like you run an athlete weekend out of your own private facility. I guess that was two weekends ago. Uh, it's like just a better environment. I can just be so much more present. So um, it's probably looking at beginning of next year, um, investing in that property and spending all of 24 building it um, okay. is probably the, the timetable on that. Because um, yeah. if I'm going to do it, I, I'm going to do it right. Like I don't care if it takes two, three years to do it. I just... That that space to do that is going to be integral moving forward, just for for what we want make to happen. Want making to happen. Yeah, me and Kyle spoke about it before as well. Even here, thinking about doing something, we'd love, I'd love to do that now. Um, you know, just have like, it doesn't need to be anything too crazy. Just something where you can have a facility, you know, and just let, let that encompass all the things that you need to running. It's funny though, isn't it? Like we all start in personal training, go online, and suddenly we all have a facility to do coaching again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. Yeah. You know, if we um if if we stay in the UK over the next kind of twelve to eighteen months, uh, obviously with the situation with the um with the house at the moment, and we'll yeah. we'll uh if we stay in the UK, we'll sell and 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 get somewhere else, still in the same area, but um I want somewhere where where we can either build on the on the land or it's got if it's a farm and it's got um outbuildings already, it's got like a little yeah. warehouse with it. I'll I'll build something in there for sure. Yeah, so we'll that's do. that's the other thing we're waiting on is we're we like this house, it's cool and all, but um we're probably going to sell it and or just turn it into a rental property so like the next place we're going to buy is out in a place that has like one acre to two acre lots so it's like you just build that private facility on the back end of that lot and it makes it super easy to just have on site and um then turning this into like an airbnb where you're making an athlete house and when athletes are in they just come and stay in the house and have a full kitchen and everything. So uh, yeah. makes it makes it super easy. So that's kind of like the thought process in oh, cool. 24. Valentin's on his way out as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the from the chocolate. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, you just get a random knock at the door one night and they'll be like, who's that? <laughs> <She's>, wow. <laughs> I told you about the package you sent to my house, right? Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! We'll save that story for not a, a podcast air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that is the, um, that's definitely the uh, the the ideal setup, isn't it? It's like having 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 you know for for me to actually make sure I train, having somewhere I can train at, at home from a time efficient. <laughs> 
but also um you know having somewhere where you can film content in a more professional environment which is just yours and having somewhere that you can use as a as a hub for you know content creation and stuff like that is um it's an ideal situation and it's just like you know like we said before it's having something you know that that is within your own colors and your own branding is like such a powerful thing in regards to being able to so just professional just have that it looks professional it's all aligned like it's just it's just perfect yeah and i'll be bluntly honest about this because you guys know this about me um i have a very small circle of people and and that's okay with me i do that purposely um and to be honest with you there's not really anybody here that's in that circle in in dallas right and there's a lot of reasons for that um just with the way a lot of them carry themselves and handle themselves. Um, it's just not conducive to moving what I see needs to happen for the industry moving forward. And it's like, honestly, the people that are closest in my circle are like the two of y'all and John. Right. And it's like, and then the coaches that I have on staff. So it, it just totally makes sense to have a private facility where I can control that dynamic and I can control that environment and I can, solely focus on what I need to do to move that forward. Right. Because one of the biggest things with like putting bodybuilding to the side was um, understanding what were actually distractions. So I didn't realize for the longest time, how much of a distraction bodybuilding in and of itself was to what I was doing, um, how much it took away from my mental capacity to process information and honestly, to deliver information as well. Um, even just like the simplicities of, when I get in a workflow, being able to stay in the workflow, like that fucking food alarm, holy shit. Just like not realizing how annoying it would be to be plugged into something that I'm making a lot of progress on and then have to eat exactly at 930 to get all my food in. Or... It's, it's, it's 621 and I haven't eaten already. <laughs> 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 I, 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 most of these days I eat one meal. It's, it's just like, I operate so much better in like a workflow environment. I'm doing my work in half the time, which is then mitigating my stress. I literally told Emily the other day, I had a day of check-ins that typically takes me about five hours to get through all of it. Five and a half hours to get through all of it. I did it in two and a half hours. Mm. That's wild, isn't it? It's crazy. It's, it's just like, so now it's like, you're realizing how much was left on the table and to circle back. Like I can further control that and limit the distractions by having my own place and having my own facility and furthering the industry and my business with people that I want to further it with. Because I'll be honest with you, like the place that I go to now, um, it's a great gym. I love, I love the people who run GASP and Better Bodies, but the people actually in the gym are not conducive to that goal. Um, there's a large percentage of those people in that gym that are not conducive to that goal. So, oh, someone's trying to call me. Hang on. Uh, and so it's like, if I'm not going to associate with those people because of the way that they carry themselves in a very selfish manner and not in a in a way to invest back into what you're doing in the, for the industry, it's like, why am I associating myself with that place, right? So it's just it's just a way for me to further what we're doing as a collective, right? It's like, I, even though y'all are pro coach and I'm no switch and John's J3U. And then obviously I have all my education stuff on J3U. It's like, you're in that circle. I see you as that collective of people moving, moving forward. Right. And I want all of us to win. Like at the end of the day, we're going to end up having people competing against each other all the time. That doesn't mean I don't see us moving everything together forward together. Right. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait for the moment that the three of us have an athlete in the same show, the same class. That, that'll happen one day. It's going to happen. You know, well, there's, there's the Olympia. Time. Damn right. <laughs> it won't so, be in Vegas, it'll be in Florida. Uh, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. I like Yanni's check in today, he looks very good. So, fingers crossed, I'll zoom well with him. So, it's just like that kind of stuff is what excites me, right? It's like you guys come visit, we have this private facility, we can do anything we want at any time. Like the <laughs> the the midnight podcast, Cal, the first trip you took down here, right? It's like I had to get special permission and make sure that I had access to the facility and make sure we were all good. It's like, we do whatever we want, whenever we want, right? We want to go in there and record a podcast at 2 a.m. We go record a podcast at 2 a.m., right? We're sitting there writing presentations at 4 a.m. and have a good idea. We just go do it, right? It's like, 
Sir, <laughs> that was the night that we went to MJ's for that barbecue, right? It was, yeah. So on the way back to the, the destination to film that podcast, Loki had a THC vape in his pocket. <laughs> it was like, you want some of that? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I, I, I puffed on that for probably like a good 12 minutes on the journey <laughs> from, from, from MJ's house to destination. And when I got to when I got to destination and got out of the car, I was like, whoa, I should not have done that. <laughs> Bro, the room was spinning when you started that podcast. <laughs> Oh, was that? That was like this. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, what do you think? Am I, am I sitting there talking about coach and you're like smoking? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, but that's that environment, mate. I absolutely fucking love it. Like just to what just just you know is is not on the is not on the front of being the athlete, but honestly, like I I love the I love the side that we're on now so much more than putting the pressure on myself to 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 do it myself because I know that my my coaching capacity exceeds my athlete capacity by 1000 fold and I get so much more enjoyment out of just living that and breathing that and the more you can immerse yourself in that with your own environment the the better because you know that's that's our happy place at the end of the day yeah, yeah I, I, I think, think, just... I think uh, not far away man no yeah, far away go go Ross um I was just saying that you know I think uh the body bodybuilding is intrinsically a selfish thing, you know, and it's not a, not a bad kind of selfish. Like you just you have to be self centered or self focused to develop and to move forward and to go as big as moving to the Olympia and get a pro card. I think if like you don't really fit the bill as a selfish person, I think that that's I think that's part of the reason that we all love that space is that like not that we're selfish, but I just don't think we care enough about ourselves, <laughs> you know, to to focus so much on that that we let everything go. I think the fact that we're again as a collective, the three of us, John and everyone else, it's the ability for us to do something with three people, you know, present for a couple of days and know that that singular unit, that kind of moment over the course of the weekend, has made the industry better from that moment onwards. You know, and we had so much fun doing it in the process. That's what I love. I remember sitting in your in your living room, Luke, we were all sitting there. They were like ah, two, three a.m. You know, <laughs> snug and energy, snug and energy drinks. I was just like, who from the arse off the vape for an hour. And it was just there's just something so special. Like those moments, you're like, right, tomorrow morning we're about to make the industry better. And it's such a yeah. it's such a cool feeling. Three, it's it's my favorite moments was that just sitting there doing that. I loved it. I think we still have to ask Clinton for the napping compilation from Ross's trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I still get the occasional person liking that video of me napping. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just snoring. It's just so <laughs> noxious. Yeah. Has, um, has Clint moved closer to, to uh, um, Dallas now or is he still where he is? He's still where he's at. I'm talking to his chain though. He'll get here eventually. Um, He's uh he's pretty he's on staff with No Switch and he's on staff with J3U now so he's kind of like permanently doing our content on all levels, um so pretty much anything that's produced for either business he's handling, so he's he'll probably be out here soon man um it's just uh he he's, he laughed because like he picked up a camera at one of my seminars while he was training with me just to casually record some content in like 2021. It was the first seminar I'd ever done. I did it in my 40 in Tampa and uh, that I had hosted myself. And uh, now he's like making six figures as a, as a content producer for people. And he's just like, even, even, even when I was in Texas the first time, I remember when you introduced him to me, you were like, he's a client. He does some coaching. He does some videography. He's not, he's not hundred percent sure on which, what he's, which one he's going to, you know, focus on fully, but you were trying to get him to, move on the side of just doing videography because obviously he's so talented and then obviously just yeah look at it now it's, it's crazy it's it's just one of those situations it's like we talk about opportunities presenting themselves right and we talk about surrounding ourselves with people who who are like-minded and i presented him an opportunity and to do this for no switch fitness which then opened the door to doing it to j3 university and a lot of people can look at that as like like gracious on my end but the reality of it is is none of that happens without him literally working non-stop mm -hmm. like this dude is up editing at all hours when he's here he's when he's at home he's literally editing almost seven days a week like 
the the opportunity presented himself and he had an opportunity to show me what the character traits of that individual was was he going to be the type of person that stepped up to the plate and and put the work ethic in to allow him to step into a position that's going to keep his career developing um into like foreseeable future like and, and i think john would be okay with me saying this like he's going to be a part of j3u level two now mm. right like because of that and it's 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 just like that's the kind of person i want in my circle the yeah. person who, when he sees something that needs to happen, he steps up to the plate and makes it happen, no matter how much work it takes. Mm-hmm. I think that's why we all resonate with each other so well. It's like, <sighs> I, I get people asking me about the Dubai trip all the time still. And they're like, man, do you have a blast out there? I was like, I don't even remember half of it because I was working so much, but I had so much fun doing it, right? Because it's like, uh, tell the story of like the person bringing us uh, food for the, the room service. Doug. <laughs> <laughs> now I haven't heard this. I feel so hard to touch, man. I should have went. I don't know why I didn't go. Bro, the, honestly, this trip was it was one of the like I've done I've done some pretty messed up stuff in terms of like work schedule, but like it was one of the most brutal, <laughs> brutal but enjoyable three days of my entire life. Because no joke, the first night, well, the night we left on Thursday, obviously I can't complain because you guys had like a 25 hour flight, but the (laughs) night we left, I didn't sleep because I was getting picked up at 3 a.m. from the taxi to take me to the airport. And then the first night I didn't sleep because I think I left your room at 4 a.m. and then I did check ins Mm -hmm. until we left. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second night I got an hour's sleep and the third night I might have got like two hours sleep. But I think it might have been after the first day it was before John arrived, right? Or was it on the last night? It was on the no, first... John, it was on the last night because I was because John was sleeping in my hotel room. And oh, that's yeah. why I came down. Yeah. So Luke came to mine and we were like, oh, it was like 2 33 a.m. And we we're like, oh, we've got a little bit more work to do. And I was I was I was finishing off like a slide for the last presentation the next day. And we were like, oh, we'll just we'll just order room service. Because we we'd ordered some um delivery food, but it never came. Um again, it was super, super late. And we were like, oh, we'll just order room service. So we ordered some, like I think you ordered like fish and fish and potato chips or something and um the room guy the room service came in and wheels the trolley and goes good morning sir and i'm like, <laughs> like what <laughs> it was like 4 30 a.m and i 4 30 a.m and we'd order room service for dinner and he was like good morning good morning sir and I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, Cal's over there God. eating like a hamburger and french fries and i'm eating like salmon with some french fries and like some broccoli on the side and we're like oh my god what are we doing with our lives right now <laughs> oh, um, uh, you just you just pull something totally uh, that you just don't have at any other point in time when you're doing a seven hour weekend it's like a big show weekend at the Arnold's or something like that and then these weekends you just you pull an ungodly amount of resilience out of your ass to be able to manage the entirety you, of the you just gotta get it done you just gotta get it done yeah, just like you pretty much work all day at the seminar and then you've got to do like I, I can't, I can't be in a position where it's like, sorry guys, you can't check in for three days. No, that not. doesn't, it doesn't work like that now. So uh, you just got to, got to make it work. That's the reality of it, though, right? It's like the difference between coaches who coach to coach and the coaches who yeah. like wanted to support their their income. There's nothing wrong with it. Again, not calling anybody out, but like I can't go to bed knowing I have check-ins sitting in my email inbox. Mm-hmm right but on those weekends because like i'm choosing to do the seminar i need to go make sure that these people have their responses rather than just like blocking off for three days yeah, yeah. it's horrendous and i hate that feeling of when you ever go to bed and then you realize that you forgot a certain person's check <laughs> like ah fuck i'm going back to the office emily just I'm, I'm go to bed. i'll sleep on the couch <laughs> like half, two, half two in the morning i was like oh no i was trolling trolling and covered in a blanket <laughs> God, I don't know when to sleep. Yeah. Oh. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't do it if we didn't love it. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's the irony is like I I literally don't care. Like it doesn't even feel like work. So no. Like when I when I when I go and like see my mum and dad or like we'll see like family friends and they'll be like like how do you do that? Like why do you do that? And it's like like I, I remember when I when I left uni, I worked in recruitment in London for like seven months, and I fucking despised it. Like every minute, I was waiting until I finished my finished my shift. And um, it was Michael Page in London. It was called it was a recruitment agency, and we we the office was in Holborn, and I I trained at a gym box. You know, gym box. Uh, they're like a London based gym. Yeah, gym. yeah, yeah. Like one of the really busy like central London gyms, which is like it was, it was fine. 
but like I remember I used to train at 7 p.m every evening after I finished um work and I literally couldn't wait until I finished work every day and then like I had to commute like an hour in there and an hour back and I was just happy to just not be in that place just because I fucking hated it and like it just it just goes to show like once you find something that you're like genuinely passionate about and you love like it doesn't even feel like it doesn't feel like work it's just having fun no it, it I could really do it at any hour of any day at any night and or, or any time and it's just like it's just what you what you do right it's just it's just a part of you almost there's something in that responsibility as well that you have over these people i think that um i don't think the word's not like authoritative but it's just like you're kind of like you're a figure and you're so heavily involved in this person's ability to move forward you know so i think there's there's something really special in that Mm. it's 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 that response it's that it's that level of responsibility which is the the main thing that pushes you to continue to evolve so you can serve in the best manner possible as well like you know you're having such a big, you're having such a big influence on their trajectory as an athlete in terms of their success. And obviously the higher that competitive level gets, even for a professional athlete, that's their entire career. That's their income. That's their sponsorships. That's everything. Even for a coach, how many coaches do we know that we coach where as soon as they actually start making progress, they've now suddenly got more clients or yeah. you coaching them and you giving them that skill set just from that process. They've now suddenly got more clients and their clients are doing well. Like the amount of times we've seen that in the UK is it's awesome to see, but the impact you're having on their lives is is enormous. It's not it goes well beyond the actual bodybuilding in the first place. Man, I uh that guy in Australia I was telling you doing classic at the show your guys doing the open at Ross. Um, he sent me a message, I think it was last week. He's like, I don't think I would be where I'm at from a coaching perspective if I wasn't working with you for the last year or so. So this guy like went through sold his gym location facility that he was doing in-person training to go completely dive into online. And he's like now scaled his business. I don't remember what the numbers were and he probably was keep that to himself, but it was wild. Just like the amount of success he's seen just in like the year of working with me. And he was like, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't spent the last year working as a client for you or being a client of me. Right. Um, and now he's got a really good shot at winning a pro card this year, which will even just further, you know, his, his progress as a business person. So you're so right. It's just, it goes beyond so many levels um, of just like the individuals. And it's like, I, I look at it as like two things, one meta impact, which is like our ability to drop a stone in water and that ripple effect start to affect as many people as possible. Um, But also like uh, there's a, I'm not remembering the name of it, but there's, there's a test that they use for, categorizing people in businesses and essentially you have like these four main categories and you have a primary and a secondary so you have like visionary you have like a behind the scenes worker and there's a couple other different ones Um, and your ability to be a visionary is kind of what drives a lot of that day-to-day action because you know that while that action right now might not pay the dividend tomorrow or the dividend next week or the dividend two weeks from now it's going to pay the dividend in two years three years four years time where your ability to stay focused on that vision is is what's driving that ease of being able to work on the day-to-day. And it's like the people who saw that vision from the start are the people who are going to make it the furthest and are able to clearly see it. Because like, even though five years ago, I had like 10 clients to my name, it's like I knew what I was capable of, right? And I knew if I just kept plugging away and kept figuring out how to do it and kept figuring out who I needed to bring into my circle to make it better that at some point it was going to pay off. And it's just, once you realize that payoff and you're starting to realize it, it's like, you're kind of seeing how that vision can truly actually come to fruition. And it's what drives that day to day and makes it just that much easier. Yeah. Sure. I can resonate with that massively in terms of like, just try to land in the right, land in front of the right person, you know, one COVID consult away and two years later, you know, it's a, uh, it's one of those crazy things. And it's, it is, it's, it's, it's knowing that you have that ability like, you know, I think it's part of the reason I didn't go off training in the first place. Um, and coaching because like I was like maybe not getting the financial return for a pretty long time, but there was I was like there's, there's something in this. I'm good at this, you know. And it's like, like there's something about it, you know. And it's like you said, just keep plugging away, and you end up kind of you know establishing yourself in time. It's like the it, it's that hard work pays off, Cal. You know, it's the fucking you know it, it will like you know it doesn't matter it, it, it how long it's gonna take is not something that anyone can kind of come up and let you know. But if you just keep plugging away and you keep genuinely working hard at something, eventually it will pay off. Mm. Mm. And it's just the irony of like you know the 
the more that evolves, like, there's how, what are the fucking chances of us, you know, beco becoming what we've become, like together as a together as a you know a, a unit of colleagues, but also you know close friends as well. Like, you just find yourself moving in directions where you're going to get like-minded people who go into the same circles and you cross paths and then cool stuff happens. Like I remember when, when I first started speaking to Luke, I don't know how, maybe a couple of years ago and we had that, I think we had like a, we jumped on a call and you were like, I want to see um, what you do for your back end, like what sheets to use and stuff like that. And then I started talking to Luke about like issues I was having in the gym with training and like injuries and stuff. And then I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to go and go down to Texas and, and see him. Um, and I still remember we were at, we were at, we were at um, Dallas uh, Fort Worth Airport with Loki, like sitting outside the airport, and you were about to pick us up. And I, I still remember I was like, I haven't even like known this guy very long, but it's like it's just fucking cool. <laughs> it's just so cool that you can just like connect on that level, and you know that's you, you find like in the area of the industry that everyone kind of specializes in, and you 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 kind of move into that realm in the industry after a period of time, you just like Luke said earlier, your circle becomes very refined and very close. And you just operate with the people that just sing off the same hymn sheet and want to operate on the same level. And like the people that I speak to day to day, besides obviously clients and stuff, the people that I speak to day to day, are, it's, it's probably like f five or six people that are just the same people over and over again, just because that's just, they're just on the same wavelength as me and they operate in the same way. And it just, the gel is just perfect. Yeah, I think it's, a mutual investment in the progression of everyone right yeah it's like uh the ability to challenge each other when it's needed to promote a conversation or even if it's just extending the helping hand to someone that one of us is working with in order to get that process back on track right like mm -hmm. it's the little things that that uh that kind of pushes all of us forward yeah okay percent refine it he's we said refining it refining your circle yeah yeah um right then that was a a little roundup into luke miller it wasn't yeah that, what, that's time, me. what time is it over there what's that what time is it over there Twelve forty-five. um got a tea time later this afternoon so we'll be going to play <laughs> golf in like he uh, done we got a tea time in like two hours so yeah. i've been I woke up at 5 a.m. to finish my work by 1.30 so that I could go to what time? What time is tea time, Cal? <laughs> I don't know. That's not, not that's not a thing in Ireland, though. That's not what we don't do tea time. So get in off the road. Afternoon, afternoon tea. Yeah, no, actually, like, oh, coming in for your tea. Like, what is that? <laughs> no, tea time, like golf. Jesus Christ. Ah, <laughs> hold on. We got... <laughs> All right, hold on. Whoa. We had a... That was, that was people, that was three different people from three different cultures. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I thought you were having a fucking... Like, <laughs> like, jazz drones. Yeah, that's what I was saying. People have, like, there's, like, a tea thing that you do here. <laughs> and then he was like, oh, tea. And I'm like, fucking tea. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that completely went over my head then. Yeah, I think it went over everyone's head. It's just absolutely 100% my fault. It's okay. It's okay. I knew where y'all were starting to go. You can remember now that I hang out with you, I'm part British too. So, yeah, I'm Irish. There, 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 are, there, are there are little snippets of like certain sentences or certain words where he just turns full on British. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle of the presentation, Dubai used proper fuck to describe needing a deload. And I, I just like stop Bro, in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what he's doing his Calby and Irish in his presentation. Right? Yeah, there were a couple of little catchphrases that picked up. I think you, I think you referred to the word bellend a few times as well, which is another. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my new favorite word in my vocabulary. Another, uh, typical one. Yeah, bellend's a good one. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's so funny. Anyway. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll get you back on for more topic-driven uh, content, Luke, soon. So, uh, thanks for your time, mate, and we'll um, we'll catch you guys soon. Peace, peace, guys. <laughs>